Hi again, welcome to part three on hypertables. In this part, we're going to talk about best practice for hypertables. The first thing when you're considering design of any table, Postgres table or a hypertable, the schema comes up. So typically the schemas we see are in two categories, wide or narrow. Obviously wide means more columns, narrow means less columns, and there's trade-offs for both of them. And you can see those in the left-hand side of this slide. What we typically end up recommending on the implementation team is what we call a medium schema. And that is in between of wide and narrow. And that seems to work fairly well for most use cases. There are some certain situations where you have to consider wide or narrow. So keep that in mind. And many times what we recommend is testing to see how it performs and how operationally heavy it is. Sometimes if you do things with more database objects, it will create uh, some resource constraints trying to manage all of the different things that it has to in the back end. The other consideration as far as schema or table design is metadata. You can split your metadata information into a regular Postgres table and join with a hyper table, or you can keep that in the same hyper table. And again, it depends on what you're trying to do and how operationally heavy it is for you to put your queries, all of your queries into a join format if needed. So just consider those things. Also single versus multiple partition table. And I've talked about the fact that we don't typically recommend partitioning by anything but time. What we found is time is usually a good partition for most use cases. So keep that in mind, but same thing as previously in schema design, the best way to figure out whether you should use multiple partitions is to test it and see how many database objects it creates as well as how operationally heavy that is for you. Uh, there's other performance optimizations you can do outside of multiple partitions. You can use indexes, uh, data retention policies, and we'll talk about some of the other things here coming up in part four. Also to keep in mind, you want to keep chunk sizes consistent or you want to try to for all data in a hyper table and you want to follow the 25% rule. So let's talk about the 25% rule because it's very important for time scales performance. What you want to do following the 25% rule is set the chunk time interval so that 25% of the main memory can accommodate one chunk, including its indexes from each active hyper table. Now, what does active hypertable mean in timescale? An active hypertable is a hypertable that is actively being written to, and that's typically via a streaming ingest process. What that means is when you are implementing timescale, you have to consider all of your active hypertables. If you have one main hypertable, that's easy to do. But when you get multiple main hypertables, you have to add all of those chunks together, the, the latest chunk, and try to make those fit into 25% of memory of your service. So let's go through some examples. If you had two GBs of data per day and you are using a 64 GB service in timescale, you would want to set that chunk time interval to one week because seven days times two gigs is 14 gig chunks. If you had a 10 gig per day of data, you would want to set that interval to one day because one day times 10 gigs is 10 gig chunks. And the important part to stress on this is you want to fail on the side of low rather than high as far as that 25%. And the reason for that is a lot of times with optimization and performance, it comes down to having things in memory and what it allows you to do with a smaller chunk size is time scale and Postgres in general can evict and put chunks back in more efficiently when they're small as opposed to big. So always round down and fail on the side of smaller chunks. That's it for best practices. We'll see you in part four, where we'll talk about some subjects that are lesser talked about and more intricate details of implementation. Thank you.